Okay, so what is the future of environmental philosophy? I think that um, the direction of my own work uh, from the land ethic to the earth ethic gives you a clue as to what I think the uh, future of environmental philosophy is, and that is dealing with uh, the ramifications of uh, global climate change. Um, global climate change is a phenomenon that is both eclipsing all of our other environmental concerns and also in training them at the same time. It exacerbates pro the problem of biodiversity loss, for example, and practically any other uh, of the traditional or, or classical environmental uh, concerns that, that we had. So I think that uh, that's going to be a dominant theme, not to say that all environmental philosophers will deal with it in the same way. I mean, that's, it just becomes a focus for various perspectives, including ecofeminisms and ecophenomenologies and, and so on. So it, it doesn't in any way suggest that it lessens the diversity of environmental philosophy, only that it provides a kind of common problematique. But I would like to also talk about the future of philosophy in general. And in my opinion, and I'm speaking only from the perspective of what you might call Anglo-American uh, philosophy, which also includes what uh, Anglo-American philosophers call continental philosophy, which is really, I think, centered on phenomenology and to some extent existentialism and branches out, out from that. So I think that both conversations in the Anglosphere, uh, Anglo-American analytic philosophy on the one hand, and Anglo-American continental philosophy, if that's not a contradiction in terms, uh, uh, both have become um, uh, uh, inwardly focused in that the conversations have become a conversation that is is um, arcane and dealing with highly specialized and technical problems that has excluded um, uh, uh, other intellectual traditions. People from uh, other domains of intellectual inquiry come to uh, these conversations in philosophy and they're mystified. It makes no sense to them. And there's no sense of reaching out on the part of philosophers to uh, interact with other disciplines, with some exceptions. There are exceptions, and one of those exceptions is environmental philosophy, which has been in conversation for decades with uh, ecology, then with conservation biology, with uh, uh, evolutionary uh, moral psychology, for example, but that's only one example of the way uh, philosophers are, in fact, connecting with other uh, disciplines. Um, another example of that would be the way philosophy of mind and neuropsychology are uh, interacting. And I've just been reading a book called Our Mathematical Universe by a cosmologist named Max Tegman. He's Swedish but he, I think he uh, works at MIT, and he's in conversation with philosophers about parallel universes and what subjectivity and things of that sort. So basically, I think that environmental philosophy is kind of a harbinger of the future of philosophy in general, not that it's in any sense limited to environmental philosophy, but that it is facing outward and engaging with uh, other disciplines and providing a certain, uh, providing a certain 
kind of expertise and perspective that only philosophers can bring to those. For, I can only speak now from environmental philosophy, but for many, many years, I think that ecologists and, and uh, uh, other uh, life scientists were basically, uh, in terms of their epistemology, they were, they were essentially in 1930s with logical positivism. You know, there's a, we're, we're objective and values are purely subjective and just a matter of preferences, like two children arguing about which color is the most beautiful. Uh, and so they, they didn't know how to recognize value or to, to discuss it in ways that uh, pro provided reasons for having uh, the values that one has. And so uh, those are just, I mean, just the, the scratching the surface of the sort of uh, expertise uh, the, or, or perspective that philosophy can uh, bring to other disciplines in a meaningful uh, uh, conversation, and also a kind of um, ability to stand back and synthesize, whereas science is increasingly more narrowly focused, philosophers can be the glue that stitches together lots of different things into a much larger and coherent worldview. So, so that's the future of environmental philosophy and more generally, in my opinion, the future of academic philosophy. Okay, uh, the question is, uh, do I think that the um, anthrop Anthropocene is a useful uh, concept? Uh, and the answer is I have mixed feelings about it. Um, First of all, I think it's important to uh, be very clear about the origin of the term Anthropocene. It really comes out of geology. And the, the idea, I think, originally was if we look forward a million, two million years, if there are any geologists uh, at that point, time, whether human or otherwise, would they see a, a, a marker in the, in, in the rock record in the, uh, of something unique having happened? And the answer is, well, yes, we, we, will, we can see that there will be climate change. We can see that there will be artificial elements uh, that were created in... Um, nuclear reactors that don't exist naturally and so on, so there are various markers. And then we can ask, well, when do these markers begin to show up? And that provides then some sort of date for the Anthropocene. In that sense, yes, I think it's, it is uh, a useful uh, concept uh, uh, in that regard. However, when the concept migrates from geology to the humanity, think that we have a very, very different uh, sort of situation. For one thing, I think in the discourse of the humanities, it provides an excuse. We can say, well, come on, dude, it's the Anthropocene, you know, don't worry about these, these other things. Uh, uh, your, your environmental concerns are old-fashioned. Uh, we live in a new era. Get, uh, uh, you know, get with it uh, is, I think, one, it, it provides a, an excuse for, for dismissing uh, our uh, traditional concerns. Uh, but more importantly, I think from, again, not from a geological perspective, but in the discourse of the humanities, the, the Holocene was the Anthropocene. And that we, I will certainly agree we're entering a new geological in, era, but I would call it the post-Anthropocene. And here's the reason why. It was the Holocene climate that permitted settled agriculture. Settled agriculture permitted the emergence of cities, cities of civilization, the arts, the sciences, and all that 
goes into the concept of civilization, including infrastructure and transportation and communications uh, and that sort of thing. And climate change really puts all of that at risk. And if you if you uh, look, there are two sort of dominant um, narratives about the future. One is uh, posthumanism and uh, cyborgianism, that we will become integrated with various technologies. Science will lead to, through genetic manipulation, uh, uh, di disease-free life and immortality, but that's not human, that's, <laughs> that's, that's post-human. The other scenario is environmental apocalypse, in which climate change will so uh, render the planet uninhabitable that there will be uh, mass dislocations. We're actually seeing that uh, happening today. Failed states, uh, wars, population crash, the remnant uh, uh, human uh, bands uh, led by psychopathic warlords and and that's sort of like the post anthropocene uh, in another in, a, in another narration so so I think that just to sum up I think that as a scientific concept uh, the anthropocene is defensible uh, within the humanities it's problematic uh, uh, both in terms of uh, its, it, its being a, a cover for uh, not really taking seriously the actual problems that we have, and that it, it, it fails to recognize the importance of our Holocene climate for everything that makes us human in, in after the, the Paleolithic, essentially. So, so that's my uh, response to that. So the question is, why have I sort of made a transition in my most recent uh, monograph, uh, Thinking Like a Planet, from the land ethic to the earth ethic, by this transition from the land ethic to the earth ethic? And the answer to that question is a question of scale, uh, both spatial scale and temporal scale. So let's take spatial first. Um, we usually say that popular or, or widespread awareness of an environmental crisis uh, occurred in the 1960s. Uh, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, The Quiet Crisis by Stuart Udall, uh, a palpable realization that we live in a world that is polluted, the smog of cities, uh, rivers, uh, polluted with sewage and industrial waste. In other words, it is evident to the, to the senses, as well as a kind of intellectual uh, realization. But the environmental problems that were identified in the 1960s were local and regional. Smog over cities, well that's over cities. And pesticides sprayed on fields, that's landscape level. Uh, point source pollution, oil spills on beaches, etc. All of these are spatially local and temporally they are correctable within a matter of decades. We can, we can, and, and you have suddenly clean air, and uh, rivers are, uh, well, they, there's been less success where uh, water uh, is concerned. Uh, but nevertheless, these are problems that are spatially, local and regional, 
temporally measured in years, decades, and so on, in terms of their, their uh, the possibility of their correction or remediation. Then in the 1980s, uh, we, I, I seem to be the only person who's been putting it this way, there was a second wave of the environmental crisis, and the temporal and spatial scales were, well, spatially speaking, global, and temporally speaking, long term. How long term, we can't, yeah, I can't say precisely, but certainly not in measurable in years and decades, in, in centuries and perhaps millennia, depending on how we identify them. These were three problems that all emerged in 1980s. I think the first one was the astonishing discovery of a hole in the ozone. The second one was the biodiversity crisis, which we, we were aware of extinctions here, there, and yonder, but biodiversity is a meta concept and that led to the idea that we're in the midst of the sixth great extinction. And then, of course, in the 1980s, uh, there came to be a consensus in science after the 1950s and so on, even earlier, there was some awareness of the potential for global warming. It was here. It, it, in, in, uh, Michel Serre, for example, in France, identifies the year as 1988. Dale Jameson, in his uh, uh, first paper on the subject in 1992, also points to 1998, which was a year with there were massive fires in the uh, U.S. West. There were, there were uh, heat waves uh, in Europe. Uh, and the United States, and suddenly there was a, a buzz, a conversation about global warming that, that emerged just there. So all of these problems then are global in scope, and, and t the temporal scale is also, uh, shall we say, proportionately uh, um, increased. So the land ethic is scaled to the local and the regional. And my book, Thinking Like a Planet, echoes Leopold's essay, Thinking Like a Mountain. Compare the size of a mountain, big compared with us, but you know, just incidental in terms of the whole planet. And he says, he also specifies a temporal scale, he says, a buck deer pulled down by wolves can be replaced in three years, a range pulled down by too many ungulates or deer can be replaced in so many decades. An order of magnitude, three years, three decades, but we're now talking three centuries at least and three millennia. So the orders of magnitude uh, take a similar leap uh, in terms of the second wave of the uh, environmental crisis. So we have to then rethink environmental ethics and environmental philosophy in terms of these new temporal and, and spatial scales. Now at those scales, things change pretty radically. For example, if you're thinking about a biotic community, or an ecosystem, it can be destroyed by human activities, but not the biosphere. It, it's persisted through 3.5 billion years and has undergone radical, uh, catastrophic uh, changes and only come out more vigorous and biodiverse than ever. So the planet is in no danger, and I'm very upset with my colleagues who say the Earth is dying and this Earth has a fever and bullshit. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it, we, it, we have then to compare the scale of human imagination and human existence in comparison with the Earth, and so it really re refocuses uh, environmental ethics strangely on an anthropocentric 
uh, basis rather than a non ascendant basis. And that was a very hard change for me <laughs> since I had been uh, an advocate of non anthropocentrism uh, for uh, largely my career and had nearly violent arguments with people like Brian Norton who were, and now here I am, uh, a neo-anthropocentrist, uh, shall we say, in the face of uh, uh, the second wave of the environmental crisis and the kinds of uh, implications for environmental ethics that this, this shift in scale has, has uh, brought into focus.